please welcome to the stage to explore the theme of folklore, our friend, Margaret Schnipper. Thank you guys, thanks for coming. Um, can you hear me okay? Is this good? All right, um, I really appreciate it. And I have to tell you, I really, I really love learning cool things and finding cool stories. And I'm so psyched to share some of this stuff with you guys. So let's just get started. Chapter one, the continental divide. Guy walks into a bar. Now, this isn't a joke. Um, and that bar could be anywhere. It could be down on Larimer Street. It could be out in Golden. It could be up at the Stanley in Estes Park. Um, it could be in a ranching town. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> it could be in a ranching town in the mountains, anywhere in the state, because isn't that how so many stories start? Guy walks into a bar. In this story, it was sometime in the 1860s in the bar which back then was a saloon, he walked into was in the Peru Creek Valley, which lies southeast of 14ers, Grays, and Tories. And it's uh, east southeast of Ap where A Basin ski area is today. And uh, we're talking just west of the Continental Divide. So it's, to zoom in a little, it's over. <laughs> It's here! <laughs> and... <laughs> Halloween costumes, year after year, this wand just keeps on giving. <laughs> so, I just want to ask, does anybody know, because I couldn't figure it out, um, what are these like white rectangles on the Google Maps? I looked into it, I couldn't find anything out. It was like, what are the white, whited out rectangles on Google Maps? And the only thing I could find was something about places in the Soviet Union, Russia, that were not supposed to be seen. So, does anybody know? Do you know? What is it? I think they might be mining claims. Because I've seen maps that look a lot like that. Uh, I'd buy that, because that's what the story is about. And, and actually, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think what it's showing is private land versus public land. So this is so that's private land that was purchased before that became public land. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Because I was like, mm, what's this kind of weird, like snow patches? I don't know. Anyhow, um, so yeah, so that's where we are. And this is just a zoomed in picture of. Um, or zoomed out picture, the same thing. I got this off of like a Jeep four wheeling website. So if you have a desire to go there, there's a lot of places you can four wheel, but that shows it. That's like town of Montezuma. There's a basin, you know, you get it. So that's it. So anyway, um, so the saloon the guy walked into probably looks something like this. This one is in Creed and that is 1892. And we're talking about the 1860s, but you know, the mining camps, and this was a mining camp, they all, their saloons were tents. So that was, that, was, that was the way they did it. And so that's something like what he walked into just to set the story. Um, so the bartender asks this fellow his name, and he hesitates. And he says, John Smith. And the bartender says, we've got more than a dozen of them already. <laughs> Pick something else. <laughs> he hands him an alias jar filled with names on slips of paper. And that might have looked something like this. So this one is a rarity from 1870. So if you find a chief jar, you've got something valuable on your hands. Antique road chip. So I don't know why they were all saying John Smith. But plenty of people came west from, for fresh starts after the Civil War and because they were, you know, probably running from something. So apparently the bartender and the friends of the bartender had taken famous names and mixed up the first names and the last names and wrote them down together and that they just put them all in a jar and like, you know, anyone could pick. So this fellow picks a name and the name he picks happens to be Ulysses S. Washington. So he laughs and says, my own name's better than that. And so without further ado, I give you 
The Prince of Prospectors and character of characters, Stephen Decatur Bross, known in the West as Commodore Stephen Decatur, an erudite, whirlwind personality. In mining towns and areas of Clear Creek and Summit counties, he first arrived in the territory in 1859, or maybe it was 1860, along with a lot of other people looking for gold. He dropped the Bross from his name and jokingly added the Commodore in association with the original Commodore Stephen Decatur of War, of 1812 fame, and because he had operated a ferry on the Missouri River from Omaha to Council Bluffs. So some historical accounts say he claimed to be a nephew of the original Commodore Decatur, but I think he just had a sense of humor about himself. He was educated and sharp and a little bit badass. He fought in the U.S.-Mexican War in 1846 to 48, then enlisted as a member of the 3rd Regiment of the Colorado Cavalry in the Civil War in 1864, serving for the Union. After war service, he settled into Colorado life, prospecting in Clear Creek County and Summit County's towns of Peru and Montezuma, and in 1867 was elected a Summit County clerk and recorder, as well as to represent the mining district in the Colorado Territorial Legislature. Oh no, I might have just gone too far. No, wait, yes, this is it, okay. Um, this 1862 map shows Colorado's central gold region. <laughs> it's over here! <laughs> in, 18, in 1868, he founded the town of Decatur in his own name in the Peru Creek Valley. Later, it was renamed Rathbone, and the town was then wiped out by an avalanche in the late 1800s and built back up as Argentine in the early 1900s, but eventually abandoned in the 1940s. In 1869, he served as associate editor and wrote articles for Georgetown's newspaper, The Colorado Miner. A few years later, he represented the brand new 38th Centennial State in Philadelphia at the Centennial Exposition of 1876, but perhaps his most important feat, his dream really, which he had fulfilled in 1869 was the completion of the road over Argentine Pass, sealing the con um, scaling the Continental Divide at more than 13,000 feet from Georgetown to the Peru Creek Valley and his own town of Decatur. He was much appreciated in the town of Georgetown and renamed and, and named the town of Silver Plume in 1870 using his using this poem that he wrote. Nobody said this is a good poem. <laughs> the nights today are miners bold who toil in deep mines gloom to honor men who dig for gold, for ladies who their arms enfold will name the camp Silver Plume. Now, here's a flip side of this legendary man. It's slightly appropriate that he should mention the ladies as he was a notorious bigamist who ran from two paths Decatur was originally an East Coaster and had disappeared in 1846, leaving New York State and a job as headmaster of Chester Academy, along with his wife while she was pregnant with their second child. His family thought he'd been murdered and left for dead in an alley when he took a trip into New York City, but he'd actually run off to fight the U.S.-Mexico War. He married his second wife in Nebraska, established the town of Decatur along the Missouri north of Omaha, then left that wife, who seems to have been pregnant at the time. Once again, no one knew where he disappeared to or that he even remained alive. He married a third time in Summit County and, uh, and as his abandoned family to the east slowly found him, including a twin brother, <laughs> we think, we're not 100% sure, but <laughs> um, William, who was living in Chicago and had served as the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, Stephen Decatur squarely denied their claims to kinship, even when his twin brother called out scars on his person. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, those are, yeah, that's it, but you're not my twin brother. Like, they're twins. <laughs> they, they did look alike. So, so interesting enough. So despite speeches he gave on the topic of temperance, which was becoming a big deal with so much drunken violence occurring in quickly developing mining towns like Breckenridge and Leadville, Stephen Decatur was a secret drinker who ultimately died of alcoholism at the age of 72. He's buried in Rosita, Colorado, near Westcliff in Custer County, 
This is a photo of Rosita in 1888, which is the year that he died. So today it's pretty much a ghost town and the few people who remain in the area are considered to live in Westcliff. Um, not sure when this head marker was added, but I read that he had been buried in an unmarked grave for a long time. So what about this is considered folklore? It's a story from Frontier, Colorado. As much of it historical fact as I was able to pin down, there's a lot of contradiction in what I'm finding. <laughs> so, you know, go with it. Um, it's clear that plenty of history has become uncertain across the decades, but why is this folklore? It's just a story of a guy, he's a smart guy, he's a funny guy, he's a dishonest guy, <laughs> he's a flawed human being, no one could ever figure out why he wouldn't admit his identity, even to his own family. It's probably shame. He knew he had not done the right thing and he ran from that. His demons got him in the form of whiskey in the end. I glommed on to this story in part because I love the bit about the alias jar and all of these folks showing up and claiming new names and new lives. I mean, John Smith. <laughs> To me, that's where the folklore begins. It's invention, it's a movable feast, and it's personal. We've all got our own little bits of folklore that wind through our lives. And I'm thinking even like what we just heard from Momper about the banana pancakes with RJ. It's like, that's your folklore, that's y'all's. That's your personal folklore, it's your own inside joke. You know, we've all got something. Um, here's something, this little ring. I bought this ring at a street fair on my block in New York City in the West Village in the 1990s. An artist made it out of Bakelite, the 1950s plastic material that was used to make dishes, now highly sought after collector's items. I put this ring on that June afternoon and I've worn it almost every day since. It's always on me. It's lived the same experience that I have. My friends have even told me this is how they're going to identify the body if it ever comes to that. <laughs> you know? Hopefully it won't. Um, and I mean, it's my own personal folklore. It's my style. And we've all got something like this, a little nothing of a thing, but it's ours alone. It's so personal. Our aspect of folklore is that it can be our own personal story, something you share with your friends and family. And if it's jewelry, priests and shamans have used jewelry in rituals for centuries. And practitioners agree that the plate, that the that the piece should first be charged with the desired energy. So I read the way to do this is that you hold the piece in your left hand, place it under cold running water, put your special intention into the piece, then lay the piece on a shelf overnight, preferably on a night which is moonlit, um, and rings represent eternity and reincarnation, necklaces hung at the front, uh, um, excuse me, hung at the throat and heart Chakra connect with love, empathy, and understanding. Earrings are good for balance and equilibrium. Bracelets employ energy for balance or attunement. Is any of this real? It's as real as the energy of art. It's all personal. Let's go to the San Juans. And take a moment to remind ourselves of the crazy beauty of the state that we live in. Um, who's been out to the San Juans? Telluride, Ure, Silverton. It's great, right? I mean, it's awesome. And if you haven't, like, it's so worth the trip. Um, it just blows you away. I took this photo um, from Last Dollar Road outside of Telluride. And this is the Ophir Pass, which is just south of Telluride. And that's my vintage truck with the ski stickers on it. Um, and everybody said that I had to go four-wheeling over the Ophir Pass. Um, and it runs from the town of Ophir, Ophir, just south of Telluride, to Route 550, the Million Dollar Highway, uh, just north of Silverton. Um, it's gravel, and it's creeks, and it's steep grades, and narrow passages. And this is also part of it so steep and rocky and oh, it's really hard for you guys to see this but this line over here 
So that line is part of the drive through and it's really narrow and it's really slick. It's shell rock and there's no side rails. If you go over, you just are going to go down and they only let well, there's no, there's no they. It's like people go one direction at a time. So a bunch of cars come over from the million dollar highway or they go over towards the million dollar highway towards array. So, um, you have to wait your turn to go. And if you want to see something really kind of freaky is go to YouTube and look for the dash cam footage of that, of the, um, the overpass drive. Cause there are people who've done it and it is like, it's nail biting, you know, it's like, it's really a white knuckle drive. Um, and so this, which I took right along the last dollar road, it's so hard to see with, it's not dark enough, but that's all shale rock. It's just shale and it's just so slick and it's just like crumbly almost. And if it slides down, it's taking everything with it. So, you know, think massive rock slides. Um, it's a hell of a drive. It's really beautiful, but it is bumpy and it is jarring. Um, so the trees along there start to grow like this in certain areas because the ground is so slick, it just goes down. So you have these bent aspens and people come out and take photographs of them. There are all these photographers there. I didn't go there to photograph these, but I was shocked. I saw them. And this is the overpass, um, which has seen quite a few avalanches. And this photo was taken of an avalanche that killed the three skiers from Eagle County in February of 2021. Um, and it's like the snow version of the shell rock. You know, you can just see it there. And the town of Over has seen so many avalanches and especially in the early 1900s, which brings us to our folklore tale. Has anyone heard of the slide rock bolter? Has anybody heard of it? Nobody's heard of it. And this is like real Colorado original stuff. So it's a creature, it's a cryptid, it's cryptozoology. And that's uh, the concept of the existence of creatures yet to be, or that can't entirely be either proven or disproven by science. <laughs> it relies heavily on folklore <laughs> and well-known examples of cryptids are the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot Squatch Sasquatch or Yeti. And the lesser known example of the cryptid is Colorado's own slide rock boulder. It's a legend that sprung up in the mining towns of the San Juans in the 19th and early 20th centuries. One story even has it flattening the town of Rico, southwest of Telluride. So <laughs> this drawing was made in 1910. Yeah, by an illustrator named Court Dubois for a field guide created by a botanist, George Bishop Sudworth. Sudworth wrote, perhaps more tongue in cheek than realistically, in the mountains of Colorado, where in summer, the woods are becoming infested with tourists. Much uneasiness has been caused by the presence of the slide rock bolter. They say it's a whale-like creature that hangs on the, from the rocks by the hooks that are where the flipper part is. So it just hangs on and waits and um, it's on the steeper slopes, um, greater than 45 degrees, and the head is immense with this giant whale-like jaw, hangs out and waits for the tourists. <laughs> then it slides down and gobbles them up. It's a more recent drawing. I think this is from 2008. I'm not sure. So the stories I was sweeping past along for some time. Um, the thing is, I don't really get this image of a whale-like creature because the first version of the story that I heard was on the REI um, Camp Monsters podcast in October of 2019. I really recommend that podcast, it's a lot of fun. And so it has it more like it's a spirit of, in the mountain. So imagine that you're camping and you see like a red glowing ember way up in the rock and, and it's like, you know, a campfire and maybe you see a second one. And this isn't like Jimmy Chen shooting a video of like, you know, 
Tommy Caldwell bivouacked on the side of a rock. This, this is actually, this, it's not mountain climbing. This is like, this, what are these campfires doing in this place that nobody would ever get to? And so that's supposed to be the eyes of the slide rock monster, Walter, slide rock Walter. So they're within the rock and they could come and get you at any minute. And according to the folklore, the rock suddenly starts sliding and you can, you know, if you can't get away from it, it's coming for you. And that's why I showed the photos of the Ofer Pass and Last Dollar Road and the shale and the avalanches because when people suddenly disappear, maybe grief and disbelief play a part in the creation of folklore. Just saying. Chapter three. Did you guys know that Colorado is considered the most active place in the country for Bigfoot sightings? <laughs> who's seen, who, who, who's seen it? Who's seen it? Who? <laughs> don't, don't be right. Tell me. <laughs> okay. Well. Who's seen it? <laughs> Who's seen it? This is really my keychain. So, um, hundreds of sightings have been reported dating back to the 1800s at Pikes Peak and as recently as July of 2019 in Summit County where a Sasquatch was seen climbing a wall of snow in Mayflower Gulch. The earliest recorded sighting in Summit County was in the 1960s when hikers saw a large, nearly 700 pound white furry creature drinking from a beaver pond. Park County has had the most Sasquatch sightings with several in Bailey. In 2018, a mother and her daughter, her adult daughter, were camping in the Kenosha Pass when they heard noises and started tossing rocks to make noises of their own. Soon rocks began whizzing past them and they took off running. It just quite, a disgusting smell to, overtook the area and they saw a dark figure staring at them. They ran to their car and heard screaming coming from behind them. Larimer County has seen its share of sightings, especially around Estes Park and Fort Collins. Bigfoot tracks were reported outside of Windsor in 2016, near Estes Park in 2015, as well as in the Rawa Wilderness. Rawa, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Um, it's near Fort Collins, where hunters say they've, been, they've seen Bigfoot chase after deer and campers north of Fort Collins watch the creature approach their campfire. Teller County has had about nine sightings in the Pike National Forest and near the Skogway Sk Sk Reservoir. Do you believe? Great Divide Brewery does. <laughs> Who's heard of Tommy Knockers? Okay. Um, it's kind of scary. I was reading about this a little too late last night and I had a hard time sleeping. <laughs> it was a little scary. So. What's that knocking sound from deep underground? It's the little men with big heads, long arms, and white whiskers, like elves or leprechauns, not like the aliens in the Stephen King story of the same name. Tommy knockers may have had their start in the folklore of Cornish mines. They're said to have stowed away in the luggage that brought them to America, but apparently they are a legend known the world over in mining communities. They may be the ghosts of dead miners. They may be credited with saving lives of miners or with taking them. There are things like, um, sometimes I need my glasses and sometimes I don't. <laughs> I think my eyes are tired. There are things that could offend them, like how miners think it's bad luck to whistle inside of a mine. If the knocks were gone, it meant that the Tommy knockers had been disrespected and left. Miners will bring extra food in their lunch pails as offerings and make extra room for them along the bar after work. If you hear two knocks, it means dig here. Three knocks means don't dig here. And if you hear knocking sounds from deep inside the mine, that's a warning that the mine could cave in and you should leave immediately. Tommy knockers are also thought to be mischievous. They hide tools, knock your hat off, eat your lunch and pinch you. They say they also appear as little glowing lights, then a strange mist will form and then become the spirit of a dead miner. This is actually a present day um, image from the website of the Phoenix Gold Mine in Idaho Springs, which you can tour today, but 
after reading what I read, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> People were murdered inside the mine. Like, I mean, <laughs> they have this really happy website. They don't talk about that part of it. So, so but, but worse, worse, worse yet, was the Mamie R mine in Cripple Creek. Um, that one, it was actually, um, it's been closed since the late 1800s, but the Mamie R mine was said to have Tommy knockers as well as a number of tragedies resulting in deaths and haunting by those um, who, you know, were killed in the mine. And it was just probably just really poorly managed mine, I think. Um, so working in the mine, they heard whispers, they saw shadows, and they were just generally spooked. And so many tragedies happened that they kept blaming the Tommyknockers on the tragedies happened. And by 1895, they had to shut the mine because nobody would work in it. They were just so like, we're done. So I think um, it's supposed to be the most haunted mine in Colorado, if not the whole West. That's the Mamie R mine. And then the Phoenix Gold Mine, and this one in um, Idaho Springs was discovered in 1871. And it also has the legends of the hauntings um, as well as the Tommy Knockers. So venture at your own risk. <laughs> One of the reasons mines were not completely sealed up was that um, Tommy knockers had to be let out to follow the mines, the miners to their next location. So that's why there's so many unsealed mines all across the state is because those guys, they didn't want to leave them underground. Okay, now we go to Estes Park, Rocky Mountain National Park and the legend of the blue mist. Does anybody know about this story, the legend of the blue mist? Amy. Cool. I like this one because I like the visual aspect of it, I think. But anyway, um, it's a story of a miner who had a claim inside what is now Rocky Mountain National Park, and it's in the Horseshoe Park area. So Miner Bills, he was known around Estes Park, arrived in 1883 and was always a bit, he's a bit batty. He, um, talked to himself and claimed to see visions and his mining claim was the Lincoln Lode and he built trails and cabins and it's still there inside the park and actually this image is from a video taken of it in 2020 so it's there. Um, so basically Miner Bill claimed to have pulled this rare crystal out of the Lincoln Lode mine that he created and that it, he unleashed this demonic blue mist. And so at night, I mean, it haunted him for the rest of his life. At night, um, he would find that it would encircle whatever cabin he happened to be staying in that night. This blue mist would encircle it. And he would hear howling. The cabin would shake. He'd try to secure the door so nobody could get in. The mist couldn't get in and uh, have it blown in. Um, and then in the morning, there would be claw marks of like a three-toed animal in the snow and on the trees, and he would find bone remnants of a dead animal nearby with nothing left on it, just the bones. So, um, and, and actually, like, it's funny, because as I was researching this, I even found that um, there are other stories about these, these three three-toed, like three-clawed markings and trees all around the West and hunters disappearing and all that, but that's for another talk. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't have time to read everything. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, this like, you know, he was always ranting about this blue mist down in town and they were like, yeah, right. Okay. Sure. You're crazy. Um, and as he was getting older and he was living up there with his dog, um, he would come down to the town and one week he didn't come down. And so they decided to go looking for him and go up and, and see what had happened. And they found both he and his dog were um, dead outside the cabin and they were just bones. There was nothing there. So they said in the end, the legend of the blue mist had gotten to him. And I found that story in this book, which I recommend. I mean, it's good. It's, um, it was published in 2020 and it's, uh, 
Campfire Stories, Tales from America's National Parks, and it has five of the parks, and Rocky Mountain National Park is one of them. Now, I don't know that I would say that this is like the most consistent book of reading. Some of the stories are not that great, but a lot of them are very interesting, and I do know it's in the Denver Public Library system, so if you want to get it out. And um, I'm also going to add, so I haven't really talked about what I do, which is mostly, I, yeah, I do like make some of my living as a writer, and I've been doing that for years. And But I also, um, I have a clothing brand that I started after moving here, and it's like a lot of it is accessories. And so um, I was really inspired by The Legend of the Blue Mist, so I'm about to make uh, some pieces based on this. So I'm just going to show you, this is like, because they haven't been made yet. This is my sketch. but. I'm going to be doing scarves and leather bags, and it's going to be embroidered with the Legend of the Blue Mist. I don't think I'm going to write Legend, but it's it's like it's it's not ghoulish, it's not ghoulish, it's pastoral. It's like you know, it's like mountains and a blue mist, you know, and it, you don't have to like see people flayed and bones and all of that. <laughs> no, that's not my that's not my brand. <laughs> so, so could be maybe one day, but not now. <laughs> so, so that is just something I wanted to share because that's hopefully coming in like a couple weeks because I'm doing um, the uh, Boulder County Farmers Market Artisans Market a few times this season and my first one is April 9th so hopefully I'm gonna have these ready to go by then um, and I will say this talk I mean I could have given you so many more stories as I was putting it together I just, I just kept finding things, and a lot of them, you know, I'll, I'll probably put this up on a blog on my website, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of the things that I found were ghost stories, and I didn't want it to be all about ghost stories, because those are so easy to find, and I just wanted to find some different things, like the slide rock bolter or whatever, and give you a little bit of different um, perspective on Colorado history, but here's, this is my website, and the blog is called Mountain Views, so um, I'll try to put these up there in the next couple weeks. Um, oh, but I did want to tell you one of the best ghost stories. This is a really good one. Is, um, I'm not going to tell you a story, but if you want to hear a really good one, it's from the Stanley. And we all know the Stanley Hotel has like a gazillion ghost stories. Like I would never stay there. And But if you do want to stay there, don't stay in room 324. <laughs> and if you want to know why, <laughs> Go to this blog, it's called Spooked, and it's part of the Snapped, um, was it Snap, Snap Judgment? And this is um, season three, episode 15. It's called Iconic, and the episode has a story about room 324, and I'm really not a big ghost believer. I'm not joking, I'm really not that into it, but sometimes when you read and hear these things, you're like, maybe, I don't know. And so this is an episode that made me like really not sleep for a couple nights, but it was really, really good. So things I didn't include, which you guys might have known about, are like the cannibal Alfred Packer. You probably know about him, right? Like if you live in Colorado, I didn't put him in. Um, also that, uh, you know, there's plenty about the women in the red light districts up in the mining towns, more ghost stories about them too. And then did you know, and I, I mean, who knows if this is real, but original bootleggers were actually the fur traders and the gold rushers who carried whiskey in the loose top of their knee high boots. But you know, I think people probably did this all over the world. And it's kind of like how Denver claims to be the original place of outdoor Christmas lights. It's like, well, electricity was invented. It was probably happening in a few places. So we, we can claim it. I don't know. Like, like yeah, we, yeah, nobody would have thought of that if it weren't for Denver. So that's it. That's, that's my, oh, oh, yeah. Don't, no, you don't have to pop. <laughs> One other thing I was going to say, I forgot. I made a little, um, a little bitty playlist on Spotify. I wasn't even on Spotify until a couple nights ago, and actually Mops encouraged me to do this. So, Because I had a playlist for a long time that was um, just songs about Colorado. And so it's now available. It's like a bunch of Colorado bands, songs, whatever. And I couldn't get everything I wanted because they weren't all on Spotify, but it's, it's up there now. It's the Trapper of Colorado handle on Spotify, and it's just called Colorado. So if you want to hear some fun Colorado musicians, 
including the ones we heard this morning, they are on that list. So thanks, you guys.